Hello, everyone. I'm here today speaking with Stella Assange, who is the wife of Julian Paul Assange. And I'm going to start with his bio in a strange twist, since he at the moment can't speak for himself, and then I'm going to turn to hers. Julian Paul Assange is an Australian editor, publisher, and activist who founded WikiLeaks in 2006. In 2010, WikiLeaks published a series of leaks provided by American Intel analyst Chelsea Manning and attracted widespread international attention and outrage, I would say. In early 2010, Manning, who reported being horrified by the behavior of then his colleagues, disclosed three quarters of a million classified and unclassified but sensitive military slash diplomatic documents to WikiLeaks, an online news site. The US government then launched a continuing criminal investigation into WikiLeaks. In 2010, Assange began to be pursued, and I say began because it went on for a very long time, began to be pursued by Swedish authorities for alleged sexual misconduct uh, episodes. Those charges were eventually rescinded. UK authorities operating as a consequence of the Swedish call arranged a potential extradition. Assange at that point broke bail, which violated UK law and took refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy where he remained under different conditions for many years, from 2010 to 2019, but was finally arrested and returned to the UK, where he has been imprisoned since in Belmarsha, Category A prison in London. He currently faces the possibility of extradition to the US and possible prosecution there on some 18 essentially espionage-related charges. According to the Irish Times recently, it's now a year and a half since Assange completed his 50-week sentence for jumping bail. And this is where the Julian Assange story gets even stranger, if possible, despite the fact that there are no new charges against him in the UK. He is still in the Category A prison, Belmarsh, where he has spent much of his time in solitary confinement. In May 2019, Assange was brought up on 17 new charges relating to the U.S. Espionage Act of 1917, and they carried with them those charges, a maximum sentence of 170 years. The Obama administration considered charging Assange similarly previously, but decided not to, given concern that it might negatively affect investigative journalism as such, and could well be unconstitutional. As I said, I'm talking today with his wife, Ni Stella Morris, and was originally Sarah Gonzalez, and she changed her name uh, to try to maintain a certain semblance of privacy in the midst of this unbelievable chaos and uh, complexity. Ms. Morris was also Assange's lawyer. The couple was married in 2022, although they had established a long-term private relationship during Assange's extensive time in Ecuador. They had two sons during that period. Stella Assange was a 20-year-old, 28-year-old lawyer when she first met Julian in 2011. Interested in the work of WikiLeaks and believing that the nonprofit media organization was shedding valid and necessary light on unacceptable corruption and crimes of war, she has said of her husband, quote, Julian doesn't like people who are deceitful. He doesn't like opportunists, and he can be quite direct. Also, people who are on the autism spectrum, uh, Mr. Assange has been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, don't score particularly high on the agreeableness scale. Welcome, Stella. It's very good of you to sit and talk to me, with me, under these conditions, which must be incredibly stressful. I've, I've really never seen someone in as complex and tangled a web as your husband, and you, for that matter. And so that's really something, because I've met people who have been in very complex webs, and 
your situation is um, unbelievably extreme. So the first thing I'm kind of curious about, if you, if, if you don't mind, is um, what elements of your husband's situation would you like to highlight to begin with? I mean, the most compelling to me seems to me the fact, obviously, that he's still in prison and under pretty dire circumstances, despite the fact that in some sense, the legal justification for his sentencing has, well, at least arguably expired. And so maybe you could fill everybody in on that and then we can continue with the conversation as it unfolds. Well, I think that Julian is, and that he will historically in, in with time be seen in this way, is the foremost political prison, prisoner of the West. He is a critic, he's a dissident, and he's also an innovator. What Julian did was he brought his um, past background as a computer programmer uh, and computer security expert into journalism. He understood before anyone else uh, the architecture of internet communication and how as journalism moved onto the internet as emails were being used to communicate with sources and so on, it was incredibly easy to uh, identify sources and that therefore any meaningful investigative journalism would be over. And so he, he took that. He also, um, yes, saw the opportunity of being able to operate uh, at scale. And this is one of WikiLeaks' chief achievements, which is to have basically become a library of reliable, truthful information records. He did things differently and to a much greater, to achieve a much greater impact. And there's, a diff there's another aspect to this, which is as a computer programmer working on um, open source software and so on, you're used to collaborating with others. Because if you're just going to work on your software on your own, you're achieving a suboptimal uh, result. And so he brought the idea of collaboration into the uh, journalistic world, which was completely unheard of. Something you now hear with the Panama, Panama Papers and so on, a consortia of, of news organizations coming together to um, go through uh, these uh, vast material that had never been done before. And WikiLeaks pioneered that. Um, and, the, and the first big collaboration came in 2010 with the Chelsea Manning Leaks, which related to the wars in Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, the U.S. Uh, State Department cables, um, and the Guantanamo Bay files. And uh, Chelsea Manning also uh, leaked the collateral murder video, uh, which is perhaps what WikiLeaks is most famous for. Let me push you on that a little bit, okay, because this is one of the things that uh, popped into my mind. I always try to take both sides of uh, an argument, let's say, when I'm trying to think it through, and to try to make the strongest case I can for both sides. And so I started, I, I would say I'm probably temperamentally sympathetic to your plight and also to Julian's plight. And so I also have to caution myself against that to some degree because um, I'm not a fan of great intrusive organizations, whether they're state or corporate, uh, but they still, the devil still has to be given his due. When, when, when operating at the scale of revelation that characterized WikiLeaks, so let's say these 750,000 documents that were part and parcel of the collaboration with Manning, how is it even possible to be judicious in their release? Because you could imagine, and if you have any objections to this argument, please let me know. One argument you could make is that secrecy in and of itself is dangerous, and that it's the role of the media to uncover and expose secrecy, especially if it hides potential malfeasance, as assiduously as possible. And so the proper role of an investigative journalist is to damn the torpedoes and steam full speed ahead and reveal what there is to be revealed. And the counter argument, I suppose, from the more secretive militaristic side or the more limited state interest side is, well, that's all well and good, but there are circumstances under which privacy and secrecy, at least temporarily, is both strategically and ethically necessary. And incautious behavior on the part of journalists 
is very difficult to discriminate between valid from valid threats to national security. What were the allegations exactly? What, what were the Swedish allegations? And how many people brought them forward? And why weren't they pursued? So according, according there were two women, and according to their own account, they went to police because, uh, to the police because they had found out that both of them had slept with Julian over the, within a week. And they wanted Julian to have an HIV test. That is their reason, according to their own account, for going to the police. And you can go to the police in Sweden for that reason? Well, um, who knows? But just to put this in context. Yeah, okay. Okay, so Julian had just published the Iraq war logs, sorry, the Afghan war logs in July, 25th of July, I think it was, or so. Um, The Swedish preliminary investigation was opened on the 20th of August. But in between that, even before he went to Sweden, there was an article in the Daily Beast, which said that the U.S. State Department was telling its allies to find a way to stop Julian in his in his tracks and to find a way to prosecute him. Uh-huh. And they knew that Julian uh-huh. still had to pu- publish the Afghan war logs and the diplomatic cables. Um, the Af- uh, sorry, the Iraq war logs. The Iraq war logs were, were published in October, and the diplomatic cables on the 29th of November, Sweden issued its uh, its Interpol arrest warrant on the 30th of November, one day later. Julian uh, voluntarily went to the police uh, station and was lost his liberty uh, on the 7th of December 2010. He was put in prison for 10 days, then he was under house arrest for a year and a half. He was in the embassy for seven years, hmm. then he was arrested, and he's been in Belmarsh High Security Prison ever since. So... Well, so the women wanted him to undergo an HIV test, um, but those that's still not allegation of misbehavior. What, well, although who knows in Sweden, what were the specific allegations? And you said the allegations were dropped before formal charges were brought on four separate occasions. So what were the allegations? So there are four allegations, three in relation to one woman and one in relation to the other. The... The single allegation which was most serious is what they called uh, lesser rape. Uh, So there are three degrees of rape in Sweden, and this was the the lesser degree in the sense that there was no physical uh, coercion. And the allegation is that uh, Julian initiated sex when the woman was asleep. Um, The Swedish uh, police had text messages from the women, which they refused to hand over to the defense. And those text messages exonerated Julian and his lawyers, his defense lawyers, were able to read them at the police station, but were not allowed to take a a copy. And Julian would only be able to access those text messages once he was charged. Uh, Three days later, the the senior uh, uh, prosecutor of Stockholm reviewed uh, the allegation, this most serious, the more serious allegation, which is so-called lesser rape. Sorry, I forgot to mention the other ones were assault and sexual coercion in relation to the other woman. Um, But, uh, and the prosecutor said, I have reviewed the interview with the women, with the woman in relation to this uh, so-called lesser rape. Um, There is nothing... uh, that is not credible about uh, the account, but there is nothing in the account that is a criminal offense. That was the most senior prosecutor in Sweden. What happened then, there was a politician. This was about 10 days out of a Swedish general election. A politician for the Social Democrat Party who had been active in the, who had held the role of um, gender um, ombudsman, who was also an attorney then took on the two women as his clients and contacted a separate um, uh, prosecutor's um, office. They kind of take test cases based in Gothenburg. And he pitched this case to the senior prosecutor there, and then she took it up. Her name was Marianne Nee. Which well, we were... how, how was it, how was it that, that both of these charges were brought about simultaneously? It. Because that also yeah, seems... Yeah, he said it. 
Well, yes, it's like, what's going on here? Because I presume these women didn't know each other. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but, and so you think, well, what? it seems a bit too fortuitous that both of these events happened at the same time, and then so soon after the other string of events that you described. So obviously, you know, there's a bit of smoke there. And of course, we're also debating whether or not there's fire where there's smoke. So that's that's a difficult problem. But can you speculate about the motivation of the of the second Swedish agent, so to speak, who took on the two women as clients and who had a political stake in the issue? What exactly was she up to and why? And why did she want to question It Julia? was a man. It was a man. His name was Klaus Borström. Oh, sorry. And it was a close call in that general election in Sweden. And he was tipped to be the new justice minister if they won the case. I mean, if they won the election, sorry. And incidentally, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. one of the two women was also running for politics. So... Uh, in that same election for, for a local seat. Um, and she actually, um, there are text messages as, as well between the women where they're talking about um, that, that they can get money if they tell their story and stuff. So in Sweden, you have an extraordinary um, pretrial detention um, regime. So it would make, he would be in prison from the moment he uh, arrived in, in Sweden, even though he wasn't charged. And interestingly, because Sweden is is a very interesting country, and they, they kind of play the stats. So I think, uh, I don't know if it's still true now, but for example, they have very low, uh, or at least they did a few years ago, um, one of the, the shortest sentence times um, for convicted prisoners. Uh, and that was partly explained because they also had the longest pre-trial detention time. So that by the time they were convicted, they had already served, um, you know, their, their, their potential sentence. Sweden has this self-image and it also has amazing marketing in the world. It has, uh, uh, you know, this, this image of fairness and so on. And you spoke to Swedes and they'd say, oh, well, if he came here, of course we would, you know, it would be unthinkable. But what I've come to learn with Julian is that the unthinkable becomes reality when it comes to him. He is, he is. It seems to happen all the time. Yeah, well, they create this, he, he is an exception to the rule. But what's actually happening is that they're creating a new rule with his exception um, that will then, that is then normalized. So if you look at the, the persecution that has occurred against Julian over time, now you see a lot of no platforming by PayPal, for example, of uh, people with platforms that are critical of, for example, the war on Ukraine or whatever. Um, PayPal and Bank of America and Visa and MasterCard, for the very first time in 2010, created a banking blockade against WikiLeaks. They blocked WikiLeaks from receiving uh -huh, uh -huh. donations right. from um from people who wanted to donate because WikiLeaks was, you know, on, on a global scale, this great new phenomenon. And WikiLeaks is always just... That's an appallingly, that's an appallingly fascist precedent. And, and it started... And you yeah. see, saw it reflected recently in Canada with the government's decision there to seize the bank accounts on oh, the entire financial operations of anyone who they deemed inappropriate in relationship to their donations to the I trucker convoy, which was huh, for very much a tempest in a teapot. Yes, it was It was the most utterly appalling thing that our absolutely utterly appalling prime minister has ever done. And that's really saying something because he's a real piece of work. And so, yeah, this, this collusion of corporate enterprise and government in relationship to personal finance and the funding of, let's say, political or journalistic causes is an unbelievably dire threat. All right, so the Swedes go after him on specious grounds, attempting to denigrate his reputation. There's moral hazard involved on behalf of the accusers, both politically and personally. And at the same time, there's a pronounced threat lurking in the US. Now, the Americans were ambivalent about this, as I read in the bio, because the Obama administration had thought about prosecuting, or at least charging um, Julian but had decided against it because they thought it would violate, it would pose a threat to the integrity of the press and violate the constitution, which seems like a relevant issue here. But the charges were eventually 
brought forth nonetheless. And it also seems, interestingly enough, that it didn't really matter whether the Democrats or the Republicans were in charge. The Americans at the highest level of state authority were highly inclined to make life very difficult for your husband practically and legally and to prosecute him in some sense to the fullest extent of the law. And so seventh, first, there was a first charge that had to do with uh, password cracking or sharing, if I have got that right. But then there were 17 more charges developed. And so you have another situation there where a reasonable and uninformed outside observer might say, well, good God, you know, the UK's after him, the Swedes are after him, the Americans are after him, and not just on one charge, on 18 charges. And these charges carry with them, I think, a maximum life's, a maximum sentence of 170 years. And so there just has to be something here lurking under the surface that's just not kosher. There's a fair bit of pragmatic strategic thinking going on here, which is, well, you could make a case that Assange's activities, partly because they're so novel and so international and, and on such a large scale, raise a variety of security concerns and legal issues, and that's troublesome to many powerful players. And why wouldn't they attempt to tangle him up as much as possible in as many legal webs as possible, in some sense, regardless of whether or not that would ever result in conviction, because he could easily be dragged, as he has been, through an incredibly brutal self-defense process that in all likelihood would take at minimum a decade and at maximum longer than that. And so you can imagine strategically that there's almost no risk at all to the people who are bringing forward these charges because they can parcel out the duties of keeping your husband in a spider's web for the rest of his life without any risk to themselves whatsoever. People, people who are listening might think, well, who cares, you know? This is Julian Assange. What's the probability that something like that will happen to me or anyone I care about? And I would say, the way things are going, the probability that that may happen to you is increasing dramatically, but even more particularly, the fact that it's happening to many people and extremely publicly is already making you muzzle your willingness to speak freely and act truly in a manner that's so pernicious and pervasive that you can hardly even imagine it. And so for every one person that's persecuted successfully on the reputational front, like your husband, there's probably 10,000 people who decide that it's probably just better to shut up and take it. And that really does pose a signal threat to the integrity of a state that's predicated on free association and free expression. So it's rather appalling, to, to say the least. So just out of curiosity, well, not just, because uh, it's, it's not minimal, why did you guys decide it would be easier, in some sense, not just to go to the U.S. and slog this through in court? Because it's not like the pathway that has opened up before you seems to be to be much easier or preferable. I mean, your husband's in prison and, and not a very good prison, not that there are very good prisons, and he's suffering immensely as a consequence, and he's in limbo and appears to me to be likely to remain there for as long a time as it's convenient and possible for people to hold him there. I'm wondering, why would it be worse necessarily to accept the extradition to go to the US voluntarily and to, to raise money for the defense and to fight this out in court. Now, I'm, I'm sure you thought this through in great detail, but it isn't self-evident to me, given that you're, I mean, you're really between a rock and a hard place, but it isn't clear to me that you've, you've picked the softer rock. Well, it is, it is the less bad solution. Um, all Julian is doing is, is fighting, using the law to fight against what is a political persecution. And the only opportunity he's going to have to make that argument is in the British courts. Because once he comes to the United States, he won't be able to argue why he published what his, he published, the fact that there no harm has come of it. Um, he, will, he will go into a Virginia court, which is um, in close proximity to CIA headquarters, 
the, the same CIA that, that plotted to assassinate him uh, under the Trump administration. Uh, you know, this is, this is the, United, the United States that has been breaking the law in order to get their hands on Julian. And, um, and they have total control over him. You're right, the, the prison situation in Belmarsh is, is bad. It's very bad. I mean, uh, you know, during the COVID period, it was extremely difficult for him. And he's, uh, his, his mental health has uh, at times been in a very uh, fragile state, uh, as it would for anyone who was in isolation like that, um, but not just isolation, the sheer injustice of of this case uh, also. Well, and the uncertainty. I yeah. mean, that, that's a terrible thing. I mean, once you're sentenced in some real sense, at least you have, it's like the hammer has fallen, you know, and it's, it's, it's better in many ways to have the hammer fall than to be waiting for an indeterminate hammer to fall forever. That's, that's, a, that's an almost unbearable psychological condition to be in. Um, there were indications, for example, among the gay population in San Francisco at the height of the AIDS act epidemic that people's, uh, some people's mental health actually improved after they were diagnosed with AIDS because the uncertainty about whether their behavior was going to result in AIDS had been resolved. And so the, the fatal catastrophe had arrived and its actuality was better than its um, uncertain prediction. And that's an extreme case, but the psychological literature is replete with that sort of example. And your husband's in the terrible situation where he faces indeterminate punishment for indeterminate reasons for an indeterminate period of time. And so, but again, I, I wanna ask a bit more because I'm still, I'm still confused. You haven't had a tremendous amount of success in the English courts, um, and your husband is in prison, even though by all appearances, he shouldn't be, um, given that his sentence has already been served and that the initial um, transgression was of a relatively minor sort, given the circumstances, I would say. I, don't, I still don't exactly understand why you have more distrust of the American court system than you do of the English court system. Are you concerned that, that, his, that his life will be in danger in some more real sense than it already is, given what's happening to him in the UK? Well, it's a combination of, of uh, fears. I don't have uh, tremendous faith in the justice system uh, full stop. Um, not in the UK mm -hmm. and and not in the United States. This case is as political as it gets. Uh, why is he surviving in Belmarsh? Well, because he can see me and the kids and we're able to speak over the phone. So what do you think people who are listening to this podcast should conclude with regards to what they think and how they configure their actions? And is there anything they could do that you would regard as ethical and useful in relationship to what you're going through? Well, I think the first thing is, is to understand that Julian is the locus of a battleground over narrative, over who he is, what he's done, what his motivations are, what WikiLeaks is. And essentially WikiLeaks is what he calls a uh, rebel library of Alexandria. Uh, the publications of WikiLeaks have been used in court cases. Um, they've, you know, led to uh, uh, someone who was a victim of CIA rendition being able to win his case against um, Albania. And it's also revealed how states behave in a criminal manner uh, when when the stakes are high enough, and when the when you're at a kind of power top tier power level, uh, in the lead up to his arrest, there was a relentless amount of fabricated stories. Uh, the Guardian published on the front page of its uh, well on the top of its website, but also the front page of its newspaper, a completely fabricated story claiming that 
Donald Trump's uh, not the Guardian. Right. That's hard. That's so hard to believe. Yeah, they hardly ever publish anything that's inflammatory and false. Well, you know what? Um, Anyways, the uh, the woman uh, Decca Aitken hit who who uh, interviewed oh, that yeah. hit piece. She's fun. Well, interestingly, um, she had also done a hit piece on Julian, so you have that in common. <laughs> in 2012, she, she oh yeah yeah she yeah. did a re- there's a lovely point of contact. <laughs> she did a uh, an interview with Julian about a book he had written called Cypherpunks. Um, Freedom and the Future of the Internet. And it's a very interesting book because it was written a year before Snowden published his publications, and it anticipates a lot of what Snowden's publications then revealed. Um, and she did with the... Uh, the pretext was that it was going to be a book review, but really it was a, it was a hit piece. Yeah, she's very good at pretexts, by the way. A real pro at pretext. She was she was a butter won't melt in your mouth, lovely, polite English woman who had nothing but the best intentions and who we helped set up her um, technical production because she couldn't quite handle it herself and who was all smiles and cheer until she actually let her poison tongue loose. And so she was quite the creature as far as I was concerned. So uh, it's lovely to know that he, my hus- your husband and I have that in common. Why do you trust this man? Well, because I know him. Well, okay, so tell tell me. I mean, I mean, this is a genuine question. It's not a it's not an artificial closer. I mean, you're in a tricky situation. I mean, you're you're dealing with a man who's by his by your own account very charismatic and, and very powerful technically and in terms of reputation. And he has a lot of enemies and a lot of allegations against him, any one of which could easily taint his reputation permanently. And yet you've decided not only to support him, let's say professionally, but also to lock your life into his life when you, at least in principle, had other options. And you say you know him. What is it about him that has compelled you? And you should have some wisdom. You've been a lawyer. You're well-educated. You should have some sense of how the world works. You shouldn't be someone over whose eyes the wool is particularly easily pulled. And you've come to this decision and you made a public case for it. You've paid a price for it. Why? I've known him since 2011. And this is also my life. This isn't just why do you, uh, you know, attach yourself to him. It's the same thing. And I entered into uh, contact with Julian uh, in initially, uh, you know, professionally. I observed what was happening to him and what what how the world around him, um, populated by well-meaning people who sometimes had no interest, but sometimes well-meaning people who had an interest, and that in fact he was quite a, in, a, in a very vulnerable uh, position, being high profile uh, as, as he was, and actually an extremely vulnerable political position because his liberty depended on his political capital, and that's what was targeted. And I saw all these lies being constructed around him and uh, observed how, in a sense, uh, the the surroundings, like the people around us, or the the press, which I previously had trusted to, you know, as, as, as a normal person, was malicious and maliciously representing him, maliciously representing reality. And so, it's not like I could just choose to take their side because they're wrong, you know, because because it was being it was deliberate and it was I could witness the persecution as a bystander bystander and as then as an also as an implicated party. Um, and you know, the, the incredible political we wanted to live our relationship and have a family. And even that was a kind of a political act, not because we were trying to make a political act, but because we wanted to live our lives. And so um, together. Okay. So your case in in large part is, uh, if I've got it right, is that you're not in some sense merely seeing this through Julian's eyes. 
and you're not merely an advocate for his point of view. You've been around and in the trenches long enough, and so it's 11 years now, that you've seen the malfeasance and spiteful accusations firsthand, and you've seen the facts behind that firsthand within the confines of your own experience. And so your experience happens to dovetail with that of your husband, but you've been able to draw your own conclusions independent of whatever sway your emotional attachment to him might also exert. Does that seem reasonable? I've lived this, yes. I've lived this and the right, CIA right. has plotted okay. to kill him and they also instructed people to take the DNA of our six-month-old baby's m nappy. Well, that's an excellent um, summation to end on as far as I'm concerned. And uh, my condolences in some sense on your situation. I have some idea about what you're going through, not least because of observing the consequences of, I suppose, the similarities between what I've experienced and what your husband has experienced, which he certainly has had the worst of it, I would say. But I've also watched the effect of that on her. And, uh, you know, that's not a pleasant thing to witness by any stretch of the imagination. And I hope that you are capable, the two of you, of, of holding it together and maintaining your wise counsel and level heads and finding your way through this awful maze without being tangled up in the spider's web so terribly that the, that the spider comes and devours. So good luck to you and thank you very much for talking to me today.